The first Stargate team sent out across the galaxy had only the most hazy idea of what kind of a political and military theater they were entering. Encounters with the Goa Uld had made it clear that hostile powers existed, but their relative strength, the disposition of their forces, whether they had allies and enemies, all of these were completely unknown. It's understandable then that one of the first objectives of Stargate Command's earliest missions was to try and understand the relationship between the great powers of the galaxy, their hierarchy, and Earth standing in comparison to them. This is an area of study that appealed to the Templin Institute as well, and thanks to the efforts of Stargate Command, we're now able, with at least some degree of accuracy, to rank the galactic powers of the galaxy. Now a great many organizations, nations, and civilizations might be found across the Stargate network, ranging from enormous interstellar states spanning hundreds of worlds to pre-industrial, agrarian, or even hunter-gatherer societies. And the balance of power between them has often suddenly and dramatically shifted. So for the purposes of this investigation, we'll be looking at two distinct time periods, 1997, the first year of Stargate Command's operations, and 2010, right around the launch of the Destiny Expedition. Across this comparatively brief but transformative era, nine civilizations had the most pronounced influence on galactic affairs. The Goa Uld System Lords, Asgard, Free Jaffa Nation, Lucian Alliance, the Ori, Wraith, Jani, Asurians, and Stargate Command. And Stargate Command, in this instance, it should be clarified, will be used to represent the collective power of Earth as a whole, even if this isn't an entirely accurate reflection of the SGC's role. And as with our previous rankings of interstellar powers, we'll be using the following categories. Hyperpowers, superpowers, great powers, regional powers, middle powers, and small powers. Each faction will be judged on their ability to project power in various ways, but primarily through economic, military, technological, political, or cultural means. Okay, so let's begin with Stargate Command. In 1997, the capabilities of this organization and Earth as a whole might charitably be described as limited. It represented only a single nation-state among many, as no planetary government existed, and only one nation-state in particular was even aware of the Stargate network. It possessed no method of interstellar travel outside of that network, and subsequently had only the barest methods of interstellar deterrence. Perhaps when the warships of your world attack, uh, you'll be able excuse to- Excuse me, did you say the ships of our world? Surely you have such vessels. Well, we have a number of, of shuttles. shuttles. These shuttles, they are a formidable craft. Oh yeah. Yeah. Had almost any other power in this ranking attempted an invasion of Earth during this era, Stargate Command would have been hard pressed to offer meaningful resistance. But Earth did have a few elements in its favor. It might have lacked the starships and colonies of a true interstellar power, but its technology was highly advanced. The nations of the planet had fully industrialized and were in the midst of a global and rapid shift to an information-based economy. Through a worldwide system of interconnected computer networks, the dissemination of information had become nearly instantaneous and a major driving force of a sustained socio-cultural evolution. These are all things that even some interstellar powers lacked. If you were to rank not just the civilizations on this list, but every civilization across the Milky Way and Pegasus galaxies, Earth would definitely be in the top percentile. Now it might be unfair to compare Stargate Command to a bunch of agricultural societies, but even against the other civilizations in this ranking, they at times matched and even surpassed these powers in specific sectors. This is a weapon of terror. It's made to intimidate the enemy. This is a weapon of war. It's made to kill your enemy. In manufacturing, consumer staples, industrial machinery and engineering, finances, software and hardware, Earth had a qualitative advantage over many interstellar powers, and if not in technological sophistication, then in their widespread implementation across the world. Stargate Command's greatest asset, however, was its effective diplomacy. Earth's diplomats, having been accustomed to acting within a complex international system, 
We're extraordinarily good at brokering treaties and agreements, and leveraging the shared cultural heritage between Earth and the thousands of other human worlds across the universe. With all this considered, I am ranking Stargate Command as a middle power in 1997. Next we have the Goa'uld System Lords. Superficially, their collective empire might appear highly advanced. They controlled hundreds of worlds, enormous fleets of warships, and possessed technology that was far superior to most other civilizations. Rival powers who might have challenged them were instead focused inwards, leaving the Goa'uld as a largely uncontested master over much of the galaxy. But ironically, their unchallenged primacy created systemic internal issues within every facet of their society. Politically, the Goa'uld operated under a primitive feudal system, reminiscent of the sort that had become outdated on Earth during the 15th century. Constant power struggles and rivalries between the system lords left their shared empire unstable and easily susceptible to internal coups and civil wars. Nevertheless, it was their heavy use of slaves in both their labor force and military that presented the only real threat to their continued rule. Technology was therefore restricted and suppressed across the empire, with only the upper leadership castes showing any real sophistication. This in turn severely blunted their industrial, economic, and scientific capabilities. Even so, in 1997, there was really no external threat to the Goa'uld present, and these issues had not yet become critical. Accordingly, I'd rank the Goa'uld as somewhere between a superpower and hyperpower, leaning very slightly towards the latter. This is not to say that their empire was the most powerful on the galactic stage, it wasn't, but the Goa'uld were active in projecting their power to an extent that no other civilization could match. The closest thing the Goa'uld might have had during this time to a rival was the Asgard. At their height, they would have unquestionably have been a hyperpower as well. Their technology far surpassed that of almost every other civilization, and unlike the Goa'uld, it permeated every level of their society. Their worlds were highly urbanized and cultured, their ships some of the fastest in the galaxy, and their civilization was interconnected and politically stable. But in this era, their golden age was long behind them. For all their success, the Asgard were also a dying race, technologically stagnant and suffering widespread genetic degradation as a result of a continuous cloning. As their numbers dwindled, so too did their ability and willingness to project power. They had also become embroiled in a conflict with a race of self-replicating machines, further hindering their ability to confront rivals like the Goa'uld. While the Asgard did attempt to enforce certain treaties across the Milky Way, their leverage in diplomatic negotiations came mostly from the perceived power of their civilization more so than their actual capabilities. Our greatest advantage has been the feudal nature of the Goa'uld. Our greatest concern has been a single Goa'uld rising to dominant power. If Sokar were to overtake the System Lord Collective, the Asgard may not have sufficient power to stop him. So, basically, you guys are bluffing the ghoul, big time. I rank the Asgard as a superpower. Next up, we have the Free Jaffa Nation, which technically, in 1997, had not yet been established. Even the rebellion that would one day create it was only in its earliest stages. But the memory of previous uprisings across the Jaffa population against their Goa'uld masters was a powerful force, and while it hadn't yet achieved any kind of statehood, and wasn't projecting power in the same way as the other entries in this ranking, it was still a cultural force within the Goa'uld Empire, if nothing else. But the expression of that force was entirely limited, and internal to the Goa'uld, so I am forced to label it as a small power, although even this classification might be a bit too generous. Like the Free Jaffa Nation, the Lucian Alliance had yet to come into being in 1997. A confederation of smugglers, pirates, and mercenaries, the group as it would come to be simply couldn't exist while the Goa'uld was at its height. So for now, I rank them as a minor power. Certain elements might have existed during this time, but their capabilities were extremely limited. Next we head to the Pegasus Galaxy, with its own unique power structure, one largely based around the Wraith Domain. Now the Wraith are an interesting entry in this ranking, as they are one of those civilizations that don't conform too well to the study of power and in international relations. Technically, the Wraith do control the entire Pegasus galaxy, and have done so for roughly 10 millennia. But their hibernation cycles mean this control really only expresses itself in practical terms every few hundred years. 
On certain worlds, entire generations might go by without ever even knowing they existed under the Wraith. And when the Wraith are active, it's typically only to feed on their subject populations. They have no capability or desire to project any other expression of state power. Their technology, while advanced, is notably behind that of the Asgard, yet similarly stagnant and lacking any signs of innovation. Like the Goa'uld, their primacy is largely the result of lacking any external rivals rather than their own internal strength. Even so, I think it's fair to label them a hyperpower, as in the specific time frame, in this galaxy, their rule, such as it is, is completely unchallenged. Now the Janai are one of the many civilizations that have suffered under the Wraith, but have managed to adapt in a unique way. While they outwardly purport to be a race of simple farmers and laborers, they are in fact an industrialized, militarized society, carefully hidden so as to prevent their eradication. They are roughly 60 years behind Stargate Command and Earth, though this still places them in the upper tier of technological sophistication. But maintaining this facade makes it difficult for the Janai to project power, difficult but not impossible. They maintain a number of hidden bases and outposts across the galaxy, as well as a large intelligence network. Like Stargate Command, they have leveraged their shared heritage with other, more primitive human civilizations to acquire trading partners and informants. This emphasis on covert operations has given the Janai a far greater understanding of the Pegasus Galaxy than their limited technology might otherwise have allowed. Since Atlantis was returned to the ancestors, the Janai are the most powerful and organized group of humans fighting the Wraith. But their limited population, and the ultimate necessity of keeping their comparatively advanced nature hidden from the Wraith is still a major limiting factor. I'd rank the Janai as a regional power. This takes us to the Asurians, one of the few technologically advanced species in their galaxy to overcome the Wraith. A race of nanomorphs created by the same ancients who laid the foundations of the Stargate network, the Asurians are likely the single most technologically sophisticated species in the galaxy. They far exceed even the Asgard, and have retained the innovation and vibrancy that so many civilizations in a similar state of development seem to lack. Had they desired it, the Assyrians could have become a galaxy-spanning hyperpower, but their isolationist nature has wholly prevented this, at least in this era. The Assyrians are a regional power at best, capable of projecting every aspect of power in overwhelming amounts, but completely lacking the interest to do so. Last on our list of galactic powers, we have the Ori who at this time were concentrated in a distant galaxy well beyond the Milky Way or Pegasus. Their society in many ways resembles the Goa'uld, possessing enormous technological advances but keeping them limited to an upper caste of theologians. Seeing Ori warships as powerful as they were being constructed with wood scaffolding directly on the ground has always baffled me. Although perhaps this is actually an advantage, being able to construct such powerful ships while also keeping your population completely backward. Yet the Ori were also in many ways the true manifestation of what the Goa'uld merely pretended to be, gods that had descended to a higher plane of existence and were now able to manipulate physical reality in a number of ways. While the state of their empire and their home galaxy is largely unknown during this period, it's difficult to imagine them as anything other than a hyperpower. So this is how the situation appeared in 1997. But how do things change when we fast forward just 13 years to 2010? Well, it's hard to imagine a more tumultuous transition in galactic history. Right away, we need to remove a few major powers from the board. In 2010, the Asgard, Ori, and Asurians had been rendered either completely extinct or close enough so as to make no discernible difference. To lose just one of these powers is extraordinary. These are all ancient states with immense capabilities, even if they didn't always use them. The Assyrians, in particular, were well on the way to becoming the hyperpower they always could have been, only to have their chances wiped out pretty much instantaneously. So as you might expect, the power vacuum they all left behind fundamentally transformed the state of their respective galaxies. Stargate Command has become almost unrecognizable. In fact, I think it's hard to imagine a more striking and rapid ascent. It now possesses a fleet of some of the most capable warships ever operated and has a growing network of colonies, though these settlements are strictly for research or military use rather than large-scale resettlement. It has also acquired the complete sum of the Asgard's knowledge, and though it will take many more decades or centuries for humanity to reverse-engineer their greatest achievements, even without it, the technology available to Earth has increased exponentially, 
from limitless energy to teleportation. And perhaps most critically, many of the powers originally hostile to Earth have either been eradicated or removed as serious threats for the foreseeable future. Stargate Command isn't quite a hyperpower, as its lack of territorial holdings outside of its homeworld and the ignorance of its own population as to their own interstellar status have become major disadvantages, but it is very close and well on its way. I am ranking it as a superpower. The Goa'uld have undergone just as dramatic a transformation but in the opposite direction, to the point where they might have even disintegrated completely. Their confrontation with Earth was nothing short of disastrous, bringing the disadvantages of their society to the forefront. Having directed so much of their focus on suppressing an internal rebellion, they proved completely incapable of responding in an effective manner to an external threat. Technically, every system lord has been defeated by 2010, but I'm inclined to believe there's still a few minor holdings in competing successor states, so I'd rank the Go'uld as a minor power. The Free Jaffa Nation has, as a natural and expected consequence, emerged as a much more powerful force. In some cases, they have even inherited much of the Go'uld Empire. That said, the Jaffa High Council is divided between traditionalists who want to model their state on the Go'uld and progressives in favor of a more secular republic. Whichever side triumphs though, the Jaffa have been a conquered people for so long, their world so heavily exploited, that the transition to a modern state will take a great deal of time. The Ori Crusade in particular exposed just how vulnerable the Jaffa nation was, with most of their equipment and technology second or third rate. With that in mind, I would label the Free Jaffa Nation a great power, one however that's in danger of slipping further down the hierarchy. The Lucian Alliance has also benefited immensely from the fall of the Goa'uld, now able to operate openly for the first time. It shares many of the same disadvantages as the Free Jaffa Nation, however, with a divided, opportunistic leadership and second-rate equipment. It is further weakened by the fact that while it might operate under the pretext of a formal government, it's really just a criminal organization with no real internal coherence or legitimacy. This at once makes it especially dangerous, however, as it's willing to undertake operations and attacks that a true nation-state never would. That said, there has never been a better time for an organization like this to operate, with the Goa'uld and then the Ori leaving the galaxy in a state of chaos, and the Asgard no longer around to serve as a stabilizing influence, I am ranking the Lucian Alliance as a regional power, perhaps even bordering on great. As for the Wraith, they have suffered through their own steep decline and civil war, mostly at the hands of Stargate Command, but their collapse has not been total. It's difficult to determine exactly where they stand in 2010, but it seems likely their feeding cycle has been put to a premature end and they'll be forced back into hibernation. On the surface, it might seem like they've returned to the status quo, but while in 1997 there was no real threat to their supremacy, whenever they awaken, the situation is going to be far different. Depending on how deep their own internal division runs, I'd be tempted to assess them as nothing more than a regional power, but given the lack of information, I'll instead assume that they remain a great power. The longer they remain dormant though, the further down the hierarchy they're going to slide. This just leaves the Janai. Unfortunately, as with the Wraith, we can really only speculate as to their current status as information is still lacking. It seems fairly certain that the Janai have only benefited from the decline of the Wraith, but maybe not enough to have climbed the hierarchy of galactic powers in any meaningful way. Their early hostility to Stargate Command and the Atlantis Expedition was a major blunder, turning a potential powerful ally into an enemy. And while the change in leadership did succeed in warming relations, I think it came too late. If the Janai can achieve a lasting agreement with Earth, I think it's likely they'll be able to emerge as a far more capable power, but until then, I think they need to remain where they were in 1997, a regional power at best. But that of course is just my opinion, and even though I have ascended to a higher plane of existence and my knowledge and wisdom is beyond your primitive understanding, I'd still like to hear your thoughts. Do you agree with my placements? Was it a mistake not to include the Tok'ra or the Furlings? What would your rankings look like? Let me know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been Incoming. In Incoming, the Templin Institute discusses the theories and ideas found across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, 
consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. Thank you.